here, I was speaking to a Zoom call, and there was maybe five people max here. So it's great to, to be preaching and everyone to be here in person. And I tell you from doing online teaching uh, for two years, or nearly well, two years, um, Zoom, while it's a great tool, it's not great for to, 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 to do teaching through. But anyway, uh, that's not what I'm talking about this morning. Last time I was here, I was actually looking at G Jesus, the uh, perfect mediator. And we looked at the Old Testament, we looked at uh, the priests and high priests, and they were, were acting as mediators at the time. They brought all the sacrifices and all, all the atone for the sins of the people at the time. And we know that uh, that was through the Old Testament, that's what they did. And then later on, Jesus came as the perfect mediator for us. He was fully God, he was fully human, and as we heard, he atoned for our sins once and for all. So that's what I talked about last time. And I was, I was thinking about this time, and I was thinking about what to speak on. And I wanted to look at uh, God's family restoration. And that's the topic for this morning. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but basically how God restores broken families. And we see through the Bible and we through uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, God is restoring broken relationships and broken families. You'll have to forgive me maybe for the next meme, but I have to have a meme in one point of my sermon. So if we could put that up. Um, if you're familiar with the Fast and Furious uh, series of movies, uh, one of the big themes in the movies is it's all about family. Everything could be going wrong. They could be, everything could be on fire. You know, it could be the worst disaster ever. But as long as you have family, that's the most important thing. And funny enough, as much as um, we make a joke about that, I think it's really important, like applying to what I'm talking about today, that God highly values family. And as much as humans and men mess things up, God always restores and fixes it back to his will and his desires and makes it good again, as much as we try and stuff things up. So like I said, I wanted to look at firstly going through the Old Testament and look at some examples of that and then how that applies to us and the New Testament. We don't have to go long till we start looking at our Genesis and we see brokenness straight away. We see sin come into the world in chapter 3. We see that Cain kills his brother Abel in uh, the chapter 4. Jacob tricked his father to get a blessing, so then he had all the descendants and, you know, blessings from that. And we see Joseph was uh, sold into slavery. But from that, he, even though that happened, he then became the second in command over all of Egypt. So that's just in the first book of the Bible. You see all of this happening in Genesis, that all this brokenness and all this mess. But like I said, God works through that. And one of the big uh, important characters in Genesis was Abraham. His original name was Abram, which uh, roughly translates to the, the father is exalted or God is exalted. And we see that uh, amongst everything that Abraham does, even though there's sin and mess there, um, God is exalted. And God actually calls Abraham out and says that he will have many descendants. And that's where the name Abraham sort of comes from, sort of means the uh, father of many nations. So originally, uh, Abraham and Sarah, they could not conceive because Sarah was quite old at that time. And even though Abraham wants to have children, he uh, goes and tries to have a child uh, with their, uh, with their um, sorry, I can't think of the name there, servant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Bond servant. Yeah, exactly. And so Ishmael is born from that, and that wasn't, that's not what God wanted, so the descendants don't come through that. Because in tradition, we see a lot of the time the firstborn is where a lot of the blessings come through, the firstborn male through families. And so in this case, this was not the way God intended it to be. So then, uh, as, as we know, we, we see that uh, through Isaac, Isaac is born, and that's through uh, Abraham and Sarah. So it's quite a miracle. Like I said, Sarah was quite old at the time, but there's this miracle that happens because it was part of God's plan for it to come through Abraham and through uh, Sarah, um, through the dis descendants of Israel. So we have Abraham, and like I said, their son Isaac. 
we see that Isaac is uh, tested a few times. So we know Isaac was, uh, you know, put on the altar, and that was a test to um, be faithful through that, that Abraham and Isaac would be faithful to God. And Isaac's, one of his sons, was Jacob. So Jacob was uh, very important because all the nations sort of come through Jacob. So if we uh, put up the uh, next... Oh, slide. Yeah, sorry, I forgot one thing I forgot to mention. Like I said, all the descendants coming through Abraham, and this is from Genesis 26. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and give them all these lands, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. So like I said, that God is exalted through this and through the many nations that are created. It's uh, through a messy situation. Like I said, it didn't uh, humans sort of <laughs> mess it up a bit and don't trust God, but God still makes things right. And through Jacob, um, even though, he, like I said, he got this ble- blessing, even though it was really, uh, and maybe it didn't seem that it was for him, God still allowed that to happen because that was part of his plan to have the descendants through Jacob. Now, I was looking through a lot of the family tree, and if you look through the uh, Bible family tree, it's quite large. So I was trying to simplify it a little bit to have a look at uh, the different aspects of that. And here we have from Jacob, we have the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. And like I said, normally you would expect the, expect the first descendant to have all the blessings. And I'm pretty sure in Deut- Deuteronomy, it talks about the firstborn having double the inheritance. Uh, but what we see is uh, the Levites are actually quite special. And we'll look at them shortly. But there, you can see they were the third. Levi was the uh, third descendant from Jacob. And we, we also see uh, as well... Uh, the uh, kings as well come through Judah as well. So that's the fourth line there. So it may be a little bit hard to read. Don't worry, I will zoom in on the family tree for different parts. But what I really wanted to highlight here was just the um, overall um, descendants of Jacob and that became the the tribes of Israel. And they went through uh, the promised land, or sorry, went through the wilderness towards the promised land. If we could have the next slide. So this was the journey that they went on, right, out of Egypt. They were in, obviously, slavery in Egypt, and God had promised the uh, Canaan, the promised land. And one of the things I thought was that the reason why they didn't go directly was God was testing their faithfulness. And I think that was definitely true. But I think it also would have been dangerous to go directly because of the Philistines that were quite hostile at the time. If they went through there, they would have probably, um, you know, maybe even been killed. You know, they might not have made it to the uh, promised land. So I, I see it as well twofold that, yes, God was testing their faithfulness, but also he was protecting them. Um, and that may seem weird to send people through the wilderness as a way to protect them. But I, I feel that God was looking after his people, his family, as they were going through the wilderness If you look at the first half of that down to Mount Sinai, that's pretty much the exodus, right? They they come out of Egypt and Moses, uh, which you would have seen was a Levite, he uh, came to Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments. Unfortunately, shortly after that, a lot of the Israelites started worshipping a golden calf and they weren't worshipping God. Interestingly, the Levites were the only tribe that didn't. And through the Levites, God saw their faithfulness. And this is why God said, rather than the firstborn, it will now be the Levites that I'm going to bless. And I'm going to set apart and call, uh, set apart as my tribe and uh, are holy because they're being faithful to me. So even though, again, the Israelites are messing stuff up and we mess stuff up as well. I'm not saying that Israelites were especially bad. We, We messed up stuff up as well, but... God still brings it back to his will and his plan for what he had um, to get them to the promised land. So we'll see that shortly through the Levites. But uh, after Mount Sinai, as we start heading to the promised land, and I'm sure that this is not to scale, by the way. 
This is a very rough drawing. It's like I nearly did it in paint, but I, I didn't. I, I was able to find this drawing. But uh, anyway, roughly you can see they, they make their way over the 40 years in the wilderness. The Israelites, are, they're, they're grumbling and they're wanting to go back to slavery, which is really strange, right? That they're, they're wanting to go back to slavery. But even during this time, God is still looking after them. And uh, there's people, the kings, and I think it was Balak that was wanting to curse the Israelites. And the God is still saying, no, these are my people. You cannot curse them. You, 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 I, they're my people. I will protect them. So the Israelites are moaning and complaining and, you know, doing all this stuff. But God's still protecting his people for his purpose and getting them to the land that he's promised for them. So we, we see all that, that moaning, complaining. But interestingly, we have Moses, um, who I mentioned was a Levite. He's the only one that could go up to Mount Sinai to into God's presence. But even uh, Moses um, messed up. And there was a time when he would, I think it was they needed water. And Moses, rather than relying on God and depending on God, he basically tried to do it himself. And God says that because of that, of, of what he did, um, he could never, no longer inherit the land. Interestingly, though, um, God still says through his descendants, they will still inherit the land. So God still had a plan amongst this. But Moses, who has seen as faithful, he's the one that was able to go into God's presence, still, still made mistakes. Um, but he, like I said, even we see in Hebrews and other places, we see Moses was uh, a lot of the time faithful to God and, you know, uh, led the people out of slavery towards the promised land. So back, I'm zooming in. So we see the Levites, like I said, the Levites, because of their faithfulness, uh, we see Moses and Aaron. Aaron was uh, one of the first recorded high priests from memory and his sons. Moses, interestingly, was not a high priest. And I believe that was early on that because of when he chose not to follow God, he did not become a high priest early on. But uh, he was still seen as an important leader for the people and leading them uh, into the promised land. So Judah, I want to look at Judah. And we see from the line of Judah, King David. And we should know that line is an important line. No spoilers, but there's someone important that really comes from that line as well. So I guess what I'm trying to show you through descendants and family ties, we're seeing some important things and important blessings come through that. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this was the uh, in numbers. So like I said, this was uh, God setting the Levites uh, apart as special because as they went through the wilderness and they were protecting the, uh, the tent, the uh, God's uh, tent and tabernacle, uh, the thing was that they had the Levites around them, and the Levites were given the most important, uh, I guess, role to protect, and they had the priests and high priests were the only ones that could go into the inner sanctum in the tent. So I'll read through this now. Bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you and assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the covenant law. Next slide. They are to be responsible to you and are to perform all the duties of the tent, but they must not go near the furnishings of the sanctuary of the altar. Otherwise, both they and you will die. They are to join you and be responsible for the care of the tent of meeting, all the work of the tent, and no one else may come near where you are. You are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar, so that my wrath will not fall on you, you on the Israelites again. I must, myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the land, so dedicated to the Lord to do the work at the tent of meeting. So the Levites were given this blessing. And in this case, um, you know, they, they were faithful and that they did not uh, worship the golden calf. But it was God's choice. It was God's will for this to happen. It wasn't like uh, a surprise to God, right, that this happened, but it was all part of God's plan and to, to use the Levites to do this. And I wanted to sort of do a picture of what it looked like. 
Because as you start to read through Numbers, you start to work out the picture of how the tribes worked as they um, went and had the tent of meeting in the middle. If we go to the next slide, please. So again, it may be a little bit hard to read, but in the middle, we've got the, the, you got the tent of meeting and we had the Levites. Again, they were given this, uh, this important role to protect and make sure no one went in because if they did, they probably would have died, like it said in the verses, because this was God's inner uh, presence, and anyone that was not cleansed and holy and went into God's presence, they, they would die. So um, that was the Levites' responsibility. And then we can see the 12 twi- tribes around that. Interestingly, when I start to read through numbers as well, you, you start to see the volume of the amount of people. It wasn't just a couple of people that were going on this journey through the wilderness, Hundreds of thousands of people. And I, I try and think of like the MCG when, it was, when it's full to try and think of 100,000 people. And still I struggle a little bit, but this is hundreds of thousands of people. And maybe that wasn't including women and children when they do the census as well. Maybe it was even more if you could include women and children. So just maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe even closer to a million people in total, you know, that were going on this journey. And it's just massive. They, they had to use trumpets and other means to, you know, get the attention of people. I just think it was a massive, I mean, I mean imagine letting that. I mean, the games night was one thing last night, Karen, but I imagine, imagine doing this, um, leading that amount of people. Um, but yeah, great job with the games night, by the way. I'm not discrediting that. That was uh, a lot of people and that was great. But yeah, it was just, um, just great to see the magnitude of people and uh, the responsibility that the Levites, the priests and high priests had to lead these people and Moses to lead them through the wilderness. Alrighty, so if we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that happened, though, was that uh, Moses, like I said, was uh, messed up. And this is the verses. Uh, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. And like I said, that's where the descendants of Moses um, still went into the promised land. And I believe that's more into Deuteronomy. Forgive me, I haven't read through Deuteronomy yet. But that's uh, more into Deuteronomy as we start to read them going into the promised land and their descendants of Moses and Aaron uh, doing that, the Levites and the rest of the tribes. All righty, the next slide, please. So Judah. So I want to get back to Judah. So again, another important one because we see the line of the kings come through this and it was... God's will for this to happen, that this line of Judah would be where a lot of the kings of Israel would come through. And we see King David, we would know the story of King David and how he uh, became a king and, you know, defeated Goliath and all those stories. We probably heard them while we were growing up as well. So we know the the line of Judah, and this was a very important line. And it's uh, foretold, if we look in Genesis, that... uh, Uh, Jacob uh, tells this prophecy of uh, that this will happen for Jacob. So this is from Genesis uh, 49. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to ruse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom he belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Yeah, so, (laughs) in the clap. Um, So, yeah, so from Judah, we see that he, from his line, he will have control of the nations. He will be in control of the, uh, the land that's given to him. And we see through uh, Judah, which was quite a prominent nation, through them, they will be in control and the kings and all of that, like I said. So we see through this line, we we have uh, King David, but we have an even more important king that will come. And you probably know who that king was. So uh, King Jesus comes through that line. And if we read through 
I, the first time I read through Matthew 1, I read through the whole history from the line from Abraham all the way down through Judah and through the family. So I was like, what does this even mean? And now I look at it, it makes perfect sense that through the line of Judah would come this king that was prophesied, that it was no accident that Jesus suddenly turned up. It was prophesied that he would come, the king that, the king that would forgive us of our sins, he would be the new high priest. And interestingly, uh, with the high priests previously, they were done through family lines, right? Through the Levites. You uh, Generally, the, the Levites would anoint uh, through the, their sons, just like Aaron, his sons became uh, high priests. Through uh, their sons and descendants, they would choose the high priests. But Jesus was uh, one that was chosen by God to be high priest. And it was not uh, through family descendants in this case. It was uh, God's plan to choose that high priest and that he would take that title. So we have Jesus who is through the um, line of David and through the, the ultimate king that would come and save us of our sins. He is the high priest um, that, you know, our, the perfect mediator. Um, for us as well. So we've got him coming. So we know that we become sons and daughters of Jesus when we become Christians, and we get to inherit all of that. And just as before, just as the Israelites, we mess up, we make mistakes. And even though God still chooses to bless us and give us this inheritance that we become sons and daughters of Jesus, so if we can look at the next verse, please. This is uh, from Ephesians 4, 1, 4 to 5. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Again, it was for his will. It was his desire that this would happen. He knew that we were going to go astray, that we were going to mess up, and we would sin. But he still made a way for us to come back into the family, into God's family, so that we could get all the blessings to be his son and daughters, and we could be um, part of his inheritance. And uh, we, ch we become holy and blameless, not because we're great, not because of great stuff we've done, of course, because of what Jesus did on the cross, so that our sins could be forgiven so that we could be blameless before God. Uh, could I have the next verse as well? And this is from Romans. have to bring it a little bit back to Romans. We're going through Romans at the moment. Um, and one of the interesting things that we see is that it was first the Jews and then the Gentiles that were coming back into God's family. And we, we saw that as we, we start to read Romans as well. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So, uh, yeah, it was firstly God's people, the, the, the Jews that were first to come back into God's family, but it was always God's plan for the, uh, to make a way for the Gentiles as well to come back into God's family. And one of the interesting things here, like I said, we have all the inheritance and all the blessings that come through being sons and daughters of Jesus. I mean, I don't know how we can, how that's possible, but that's God's grace that he's given us that way, that we can uh, be sons and daughters. But the ultimate inheritance that we see is for inter eternity, right? We get, we get to go to heaven. We spend eternity with God and we get treasures that are saved up in heaven. And so whilst I think it's an enormous blessing that we have now, that we are sons and daughters of him now, we have to look forward to eternity, right, with God and to be his, in his family forever. And this is uh, from Revelations. So the next verse, please. This is from Revelations 21, ver uh, sorry, chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. 
So, yeah, we'll definitely uh, look forward to that time and uh, look forward to when, you know, there's no, more, there's no more sin, there's no more mourning, no more crying, and we get to spend uh, eternity with God. And I'm definitely looking forward to that, that time. But uh, for the moment, we get to live on earth and we get to um, have this um, joy of being part of God's family. Like I said, we, amongst all the brokenness, what I really want to take from this is that we are part of God's family, right? And just how fortunate that God chose us to be sons and daughters. And I, I originally thought of that as just a warm and fuzzy feeling. Oh, it's, it's, it's sort of cool that we're part of God's family. Like it's, it's a nice feeling, right, to be part of a family. But it means so much. God didn't just uh, choose the Levites because, you know, ah, I randomly picked the Levites. No, he had a purpose for the Levites, and they were right for the job, and they were faithful. Same with Judah through that line and the kings and King David and, you know, all the uh, things that were done through that. There was purpose through that. And I believe God has purpose for each one of us, and we just really need to understand how fortunate we are to be children of God and his sons and daughters, and, yeah, just to really appreciate that. Cool. Thank you.